So the three objectives here are going to be to graph real numbers, okay, on a number line, which you all, I hope, have done before. Compare the values and characteristics of numbers, and then talk about absolute values of numbers. We have this major category of real numbers. Has anyone heard of anything besides real numbers? Is there something besides real numbers that you've maybe heard of in middle school? Imaginary numbers, that's the other set. We're going to specifically look into real numbers right now. But there's a whole other set of numbers called imaginary, and we're going to study those primarily in chapter 6 on. Okay, so when we get to that section of the textbook, we're going to be there. But for now, we're going to take a look at the real numbers. And the real numbers are subcategorized into rational and irrational numbers. Who can tell me, what does it mean if somebody's acting rationally? If somebody's acting rationally. Within reason, yeah. You expect what they're going to do, right? So if I just walked to the door and went like this and just said, oh man, and slammed the door like that. That's not really rational. That was not a big slam, I know. There's a damper on the door. There's no reason for me to want to do that. That would be irrational behavior, right? For somebody just getting up and yelling in the middle of class to be acting irrationally. So let's think about those words as we talk about numbers. And it will help you remember. So what I like to think about is this. A number that is irrational... Its decimal part has no predictability. So for example, has anybody ever tried to do like the, how many digits can you remember in pi in middle school? There's always like that competition, which it really just sees you can memorize that something. But it's like 3.141529, they go on and on. Now, the numbers or the decimals that represent the value of pi, which we know is the ratio of circumference to diameter, those decimals go on forever. And they have absolutely no pattern to them whatsoever. We call that kind of a number an irrational number. It can't be represented as a fraction, and its decimal can never have a repeating part. There's no bar over any of it. Whereas rational numbers would be what then? If I just categorize irrational for you, what would rational be? A terminating decimal. A terminating decimal? What else? Turn into a fraction. Something that can be turned into a fraction, or there's a third part which is kind of like a terminating decimal, or they kind of are near each other. Whole oh, a whole number, absolutely. I, which is a terminating decimal. Five is 5.0, really. A number that can be written out. A number that can be written out. What do you mean? As you without having to use like repeating sign or ellipses. Okay, but a repeating sign is still rational, so let's be careful with that statement. Something that is not repeating is irrational. That goes on forever with no repetition. But think about the number two-thirds. Two-thirds as a decimal. Yeah, 0.6 repeating. And two-thirds is a fraction, isn't it? And we know that fractions are definitely rational. So repeating decimals, terminating decimals, and fractions are all representations of rational numbers. You should probably jot that down maybe in this category here, right? So under rational numbers, before we get to the subsets of integers and whole numbers and natural numbers, we should write down that rational numbers are either fractions, it could be improper or proper, it does not matter, okay, so fractions, terminating decimals, or repeating decimals, or repeating decimals, okay, now, a terminating decimal actually is really a repeating decimal. I know, right, you're like, how does that work? Well, what's 5.2 really? Yeah, there's a repeat after it, isn't there? So every terminating decimal really has an infinite amount of zeros afterward. So technically speaking, we could really just say anything that repeats as a repeating decimal and anything that's a fraction. But then you have to remember that 5.2 is really a repeating decimal. If you think about 5.2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, infinitely. Okay? So when we think about this, remember those three types. For irrational numbers, irrational, just think about things that have no pattern to the decimal that repeat. The decimal or the, the decimal place values that go on forever have no pattern to them whatsoever. Okay, so examples of irrational numbers are things like pi. Okay, that's one simple example. There are other examples. There's a constant called e, which is the natural logarithm base, and it's 2.718 dot dot dot. It goes on forever with no repeating pattern at all. Okay. What are some other examples of irrational numbers? And these are ones that people don't really think about a lot. 
But there's a whole system of them. There's a ton of them. There's an infinite amount of them, actually. Give me, generalize that. Don't just give me an example. Good. The square root of a non-perfect square. Right? Think about it. What's the square root of 4? It's just 2, right? And the square root of 9 is 3. But square root of 5, square root of 6, square root of 7, square root of 8 are all irrational. Any radical with a non-perfect square, I'm just putting NPS, non-perfect square, a square root of a non-perfect square, a okay, non-perfect square is always going to be irrational. For example, okay, square root 7, or square root 3, or as Lucas said, square root 5, you can give an example, right? Okay? Something that is a non-perfect square, and clearly perfect squares, those square roots are rational numbers because those turn out to be simply whole numbers in the end. So examples of rational numbers, we said fractions, we said repeating decimals, or something where it's a terminating decimal. Okay, those are the three examples we gave for rational numbers. Are we clear on how to distinguish between those two? Okay, there's a theorem that if you study a little bit more math, especially in college, you'll learn that there are more irrational numbers than there are rational numbers. Can anybody suppose why that may be? Why are there more irrational numbers than there are rational numbers? Yeah, there's many more non-perfect squares, and then on top of that, things like square root of 3.1, square root of 3.2, that's also an irrational number. Square roots of decimals that are non-perfect squares are also irrational. There are more irrational than there are rational. Now, we're not going to in this class prove that or anything, but there are proofs to that. But you do that in like abstract math in college. If you were really a math major, or if you were like an engineer or a science major, you wouldn't do that kind of math. That's more like just theoretical stuff. You would do applied stuff if you're in science and in technology or engineering. Um, all right, let's go to integers. What is an integer now? What is an integer? It's any whole number that's either positive or positive or negative. Yeah, any whole number that's either positive or negative. Positive or negative. So we're looking at numbers like, I'm going to go dot, 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 negative 3, negative 2, Negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot. What am I saying? I'm saying all of these integer values are whole numbers and they're opposites. Okay, whole numbers and they're opposites. So that kind of makes it easier to define whole numbers, but we have to think, though, for whole numbers, okay, here's how I remember it. Well, somebody can tell me the answer, but I'll give you a trick to remember between whole numbers and natural numbers because there's a small distinguishing characteristic. Right. Yeah, it's zero and everything positive. It just doesn't include the negatives. If you think of a hole, you think of a circle. Agreed? Like a hole in the ground? So that's how you remember that whole numbers also include zero. Because natural numbers are almost the exact same thing. They're called the counting numbers. But you start with one instead. So whole numbers are zero, one, two, dot, dot, dot. Whereas natural numbers start at one, not at zero. It really doesn't... At the end of the day, it's not a big deal between the difference between the two of them, right? Okay, let's be honest. In life, nobody's going to really call you out if you say something a whole number versus a natural number. But math terminology is good to know. Okay, so whole numbers, think a hole in the ground, although it's not spelled that way. It's a homonym, right? H-O-L-E. So a hole in the ground is an O. Remember that the zero goes there. Natural numbers, remember that those are counting numbers. If you were counting the amount of dollars that you have, would you ever start with zero? No, you start counting. You say one, two, three, four. You count out like dollar bills. Or you count out whatever, poker chips or baseball cards, whatever it may be. But you don't start with zero. It doesn't make sense. So for natural numbers or counting numbers, start wherever you would count, which is the number one. Okay? Questions? Are we good on this? Okay, the next slide just has... Okay, while we're seeing our definitions, you don't need to write these down because it's already on there for you. And this is the stuff that we just went over. Okay? Take a quick second just to read through it and ask me any questions you might have on this. So this is exactly what we just stated a moment ago. Just 
look up when you're done. No rush, though. Please keep working, but just so I know when people are done, look up. And please, it's never a speeding race when it comes to reading stuff. Make sure you understand it before you actually stop reading it. It's not often that you're going to have to memorize vocabulary and math, okay? but you have to understand vocabulary more than memorizing it. It's better that you know what things are and why they are what they are. All right, so let's take a look now at number lines for a moment. I'm going to assume everybody has seen a number line before. Does this look unfamiliar to anyone? And you need to be honest at the beginning of the year. Don't feel embarrassed by things. I'm asking these so I know that we're on the same wavelength. Um, a number line is simply used to situate the relative position of two values, right? That's all it's saying. And you don't realize that because you see number lines a lot in like history class and uh, anything with a timeline is usually used there. But it's really looking at two relative values, one greater than the other. This is where uh, inequalities come from. Okay, inequalities are based on the idea of number lines as positions of two values. So let's take a look at it. This is an example of something that's like a simple SAT level question that you would have in a math test. Okay, Find the coordinate of the point two-thirds of the way from A to B. Okay. You can count. It's very simple in this case. You could do a little bit of math. Um, a little bit of algebra to solve it if you'd like. But it works out that it's a little bit nicely set up. makes it easy because two-thirds works out well here with the, with the spacing that we have set up. Can somebody step me through this beginning of this process here? What's the beginning of the process here? What would I do? How would I figure out two-thirds of the distance? I saw Luca's hand, but I want to get somebody else to answer the last question. What's the distance between A and B to start? What is the distance between A and B to start? Six units, right? It's clearly six units. Okay, now I want to know, I want to figure out a point that's two-thirds of the way from A to B. Two-thirds of the way. So is it closer to A or closer to B? You said A, you said B. Uh, are you sure? B. B? B? B, are we all just joining in with the B comments, or we agree? It's B, but I want to make sure we understand, because the wording can be mis misleading in these problems. Two-thirds of the way from A to B means it's going starting from A, and go two-thirds of the way there toward B. So we start at A, and we go in this direction, and we don't know when to stop. We know when we're going to stop when we get two-thirds of the way there, but the question becomes, what is two-thirds of the way there? How do you figure that out? Well, I know this too, but I'm just trying to like, figure out a way to explain it. Okay. The answer is two. That's fine. But the question was, how do we know when we're almost there? How do we figure out two-thirds of the way there? Well, since there's six spaces and it's two-thirds, you just multiply the denominator to six. And the numerator is four. Yeah, numerator is good. Four so in math, the word of means times. If I said, give me... 50% of your money right now. You give me half the money, right? I mean, you wouldn't really do that. Obviously, I would never ask that. But you would trade over half of it, 50%, and you multiply by one half. If you had $30, you multiply by one half, it's $15. So it's the same thing. Of means multiply. So that's how you get there as far as algebraically. Now, you simply go two-thirds times the distance, which is six, and that gives you a distance of four units. So we go one, two, three, four units over, and we stop here. And lo and behold, it is indeed two. Okay? Simple problem. Easy to medium level problem on an SAT math. Not difficult. I'd say easy to medium. They have three levels of problems. That's what this would be categorized. Okay, but this is an idea of a number line application. Very simple. Okay, but something you could uh, use to understand the idea of fractional components and distance. That's what you're trying to apply here. All right, the next one is a little more tricky. So I will tell you now that just guessing and checking won't really help you too much. A number line, on a number line shown below, determine the coordinate or coordinates, that's what that S means, right? Either one or more coordinates that are half as far from A as they are from B. Half as far from A as they are from B. Okay, there's algebraic methods to solve this. There's also just looking at the graph and trying to come up with it to solve it. OK, 
Can somebody tell me what this means before I ask? I'm not asking for an answer, but what are we trying to figure out? And how can you say, give me some characteristic about this coordinate that we're going to look for? Say it one more time, a little louder. Coordinate on the number line is just one dimensional. So we're, it's still called coordinate, not XY coordinate. But as far as the problem goes, what do you know about it when it says you want to find coordinates that are half as far from A as they are from B? Um, Give me a hypothetical. If it's two units from A, how far would it be from B? Why? Yeah, simply put, 2 is half of 4. If it was 3 units from A, it would be 6 units from B. If it was 5 units away from A, it would be 10 units away from B. Agreed? All right. Now, do I really want to sit here and say to myself, all right, let me try every single number? All right, I don't want to do that. But just for, say you did it and no idea to do this, and you're on the SAT and you want to do like a guess and check that. Start with the numbers in between A and B. Are any of those half as far from A as they are from B? Uh, negative 3. I absolutely agree. Let's take a look. Here's negative 3. How far is it from A? What's this distance? Two units. What's this distance? Four units. Isn't it half as far from A as it is from B? So that is indeed one of our answers. Very good. But I'm going to tell you now there's another answer and it's not as obvious. Okay, there's definitely another answer, and it's not as obvious at all. And I'll tell you this, I don't even think it's on the number line that we're seeing here, obviously. The number lines go on forever. If a number is to the right of B, a number is over here on this side of the graph to the right of B. So now we're over here, right? If I'm over there, I know that the number is really closer to B than it is to A. Agreed? So if I pick, like, the number 4, that's only 3 units from B, and that's really far from A. So any number over here isn't going to work because in a moment ago we said it's closer to A than it is to B. That's what we said here. It's half as far from A than it is from B. So it's got to be over here somewhere. It can't be in this range. So it's got to be the left of A somewhere. Negative eight. Not negative 8. Negative 11. Why negative 11? Because negative 11 is 6 away from negative 5 and it's 12 away from 1. Yeah, so if we think about this, the number negative 11 out here, that makes this six units away, and this is also six units. So this whole thing has to be 12. So this overall distance, you could have just added it on to that side, and you know it would have been double the distance away. Okay, again, since I know that this distance is six, if I tack on another six units over here, now it's gonna be six units away from A, where it's 12 units away from B. And six units behind negative five is indeed negative 11. You don't wanna guess and check. We want to use some algebraic approach. Some algebraic approach. So let's take a look at this. So let's call some random point x. Okay? We'll call some value x that we're looking for. Now, the distance between x and a, if I knew that x was, let's say x was 5, how would I find the distance between x and b? What would I do with those two numbers? Subtract. Subtract, everyone. Subtract them. I would subtract 5 minus 1 and say the distance between them is 4. So, technically speaking, if I'm just picking a random point x and then this random variable a and this random variable b, I can think about this and say I can set up a ratio, a proportion, because I'm told that it's half as far. So, the distance between x and point a and the distance between, and I should really do this, which we'll talk about that in a moment, what the absolute value is, and the distance between x and b. That ratio reduces to what value? What would I set that equal to to solve this here? This is tricky. I know it's tricky. How much as a factor further is it from B than it is from A? What did we say? What does it say in the problem? They are always what? Second line. Half as far from A as they are from B. Well, x minus a is the distance from a. So if that distance were 1, what would the distance from b be? Thank you, Paul. 2, right? Half. So really, in this problem, I could just set up a proportion like this, and I could solve for x. 
Because I know what A and B are, don't I? A is negative 5. B is 1. I could solve this equation now. And I have a proportion where I could cross multiply and go ahead and solve for X. This would give you both solutions. Now, the tricky part is that we have to remember, based on where we are, this is going to change. So I put the absolute value there. Put the absolute value there because if I'm looking at a distance, it's never going to be a negative distance. That's called displacement in math. We're just looking at the overall distance. So I put these absolute values now. If the point were somewhere in here, let's say the point were somewhere, and I'm going to, can I shade this? I'm going to use green. Okay, let's say the point were somewhere in this region. And I wanted to find the distance between the point and A. Say the point were negative 2. I would say negative 2 minus negative 5. Well, that's going to give me 3. And that's indeed 3 units away. But if the point were in here, and I want to find the distance from B, I would have to do B minus that point. Because whenever you're looking for a distance, it's the larger number minus the smaller number. If I subtracted and I did it the other way, and I did like, say I did 2 minus 5, I'd get negative 3, right? But we're not looking at negative distances here, we're looking at positives. So if the solution were somewhere in that green range, what I would do is this. I would say, well, this is really just going to be whatever the solution is minus the A value over whatever B is, and B we know, so I should fill that in first. Okay, whatever B is, which is 1, minus that X value, and that equals 1 half. So what I ended up doing is this. The absolute values here just told me that I'm looking for a distance, whereas by changing the order of the variable and the number, it actually makes an appropriate subtraction problem, or else you get a negative answer on the outside here. Okay, so if you look at this and you go to solve for X, You'll end up getting negative 3 as your solution, solving this for x. How would you solve this for x? Yeah, just cross multiply. Okay. When you cross multiply, though, make sure that you do the following. And okay, whenever you cross multiply, you have to distribute also. So you're taking this whole thing in parentheses times that 1. This whole thing in parentheses times that 2 right there. Okay, so it's 2 times the quantity. I'm going to put x plus 5 because this negative negative here makes that a positive. And that's equal to 1 times 1 minus x. Okay, and I'm going to leave that open for you if you'd like to solve, but this is going to give us a solution of 3. Or was it negative 3 that we had, right? It was negative 3 that we started with. Yeah. That's one of the answers. But there's another answer that we had, right? Didn't you say it was negative 11, Luca? Isn't that what you said earlier? Now, we could check that, which we did. We saw that it was 6 units and 12 units away. But hypothetically speaking... If a point were somewhere over here on the number line, okay, somewhere out here, well, now it's behind A, it's also behind B. So if I wanted to find the distance in the way from A it is, I would take A and subtract that point. The distance from B, I would take B and subtract that point. So what would change about my proportion here? How would this setup alter? What would change about it? Right. And the denominator would stay the same way it is. So again, if the point were, if the point were over here, somewhere in space over here, and we were trying to find the distance from A, we'd say whatever this is minus that point. So it would be negative 5 minus that point, as opposed to here where we did whatever that point was minus negative 5, because it was in front of it. So the only difference that you would change here to solve for the other value is you would rewrite this numerator here as negative 5 minus x over 1 minus x, set that equal to 1 half, and solve. Okay, so this would give you one solution from this setup if we carry down, and if we were to carry down the next part over here, we would get the other solution solving for this. Okay, again, it has to do with the idea that when you subtract two things to get a distance, it's always got to be the bigger minus the smaller number. You can never say like, how much more money do I have than you? You have, you know, eight dollars, I have two dollars, but you clearly have six dollars more than me. I wouldn't say I have negative six dollars more than you, although that is true, it doesn't really make much sense. Okay, you would use the larger number minus the smaller number to find that difference or to find the distance between two points. So when we're looking at a number line, it's good to understand that we're looking at the relative distance between two values. Okay? The distance between two values. Tonight that test you on that idea. So use this as an application or as a guideline to help you solve that. Okay? To help you solve that.
All right, so what is an inequality? I know there's a definition up there, but what does it do? What, what kind of a statement is it really? Yeah, so it's a statement that just compares two numbers, a greater than or a less than. It could be a greater than or equal to, it could be a less than or equal to as well. It just compares the relative values of two numbers. So obviously we use inequalities with number lines, because a moment ago we talked about how that does separate the value of two numbers. Okay? Simple, simple, simple kind of question. Okay, just to understand that we know what it is. Graph these two numbers on a simple number line and write an equality statement comparing their values. So I'm going to put a number line up. I'm going to put zero here. You don't need to put every single value down, but the distances should be relatively close. So if I put five here, all right, there's five, and I'll put a dot. That's a closed in circle. Because okay, that's an actual value. Negative 0.5 should be just pretty much right next to the zero. Okay, so just make sure it's kind of drawn to scale when you make number lines. And I'll just put a value at negative one. Okay, so we know that that's halfway between the two. What would the inequality statement say? How do you compare these two numbers? Which is larger than the other? Anybody? Which number is bigger here? What is it? Five, good. So we'd say five is greater than negative one half. How do I know that? Because five is to the right of negative one half on the number line. I know this seems so trivial and basic, but it's good to understand the interpretation. To the right of something means bigger than. To the left of something means less than. Okay? So if I were to read this inequality backwards, what would this inequality state? How do I read it backwards? Negative one half is less than five. Yeah. It's the same thing as saying 5 is greater than negative 1 half, right? Okay, I'm taller than you, or uh, that wouldn't usually be the state, I'm usually shorter. I'm shorter than you, or you're taller than me. Okay, depending on the scenario, it's the same statement really. Okay, you're just saying it in the reverse direction. Are we clear on that? We can read left to right and right to left. Be able to read in both directions. We'll see that come up. Take a quick look at what absolute value is and how it's defined. Okay. So, absolute value we define as the distance from zero on a number line. The distance from zero on a number line. So, if I were to look at a number like negative three, what's the absolute value of negative three? Three. Three. Well, how do we know that? What's the distance between those two points on the number line? The distance is three. It's not negative three. The distance just means the gap, how far they're spread apart. These two numbers are spread apart by three units of length. Okay, so the absolute value of a number is simply the distance from zero on a number line. Okay, the distance from zero on a number line. Now, if we want to remember how to represent this algebraically, okay, we'd say the following. There are three cases. We say that the absolute value, and we're going to put a little squiggly bracket known as a uh, brace. It's called a brace. We'll put a brace because we're going to have three different scenarios. If the absolute, value, uh, the absolute value of A is equal to three different things based on certain conditions. If A is already positive, if A is zero, or if A is negative. If A is already positive, the absolute value of A is just whatever A was, right? So for a number like seven, the absolute value of seven is still simply seven. So the absolute value of A is simply just A when it's positive. If it's zero, what's the absolute value of zero always? Zero. But when a number is negative, the absolute value is the what of that number? Good, but algebraically, you're right. It is the distance from zero. Algebraically, how would it represent that? As a positive. As a positive, very good. So say the number were negative three, what did we do to get the positive three? We did what to this number? Don't add. What did you multiply by instead of adding? Oh, uh, negative two. Uh, no, not negative two. Negative one. Negative one. So you take the opposite of what you have, right? You multiply by negative one. So this is how we write it. We write it like that. We say that if A is positive, then the absolute value of A is just A. If A is zero, the absolute value is just zero. But when A is negative, we just take the opposite of whatever it was to get the absolute value. So if A was negative seven, the absolute value is just seven. This is how we write what's called a piecewise function. So you've heard of functions before. You've heard of linear functions, I'm sure. 
Uh, maybe some of you have heard of quadratics by now, or parabolas. The shape of parabola function is quadratic. Here, this is a piecewise function. It's segmented. Its domain is restricted. Remember domain and range? Have you heard those terms? The domain, when the domain is greater than zero, it's just A. When the domain is equal to zero, it's just zero. When the domain is something like negative or less than zero, it's the opposite of whatever A was. This is called the piecewise function. Anybody know what the graph of this looks like? Anybody know what the graph of an absolute value function is? It's like a yeah, it's like a, a V shape or a triangle. It looks like this. Can anybody explain why that is now based on this piecewise definition I just wrote on the board? Huh? Because it, it can't be lower than zero. Okay, good. One reason. Want to keep going? I want you to use the piecewise definition to describe why this graph looks the way it looks. Okay, so there's symmetry. The symmetry is because the same on both sides is very good. Y will always go up, no matter how far you're always going up. Also, look at, think about linear functions, folks. Positive slope means what? Increase. Well, when A is here, think about this as like a positive. It's going up. When it's negative, wouldn't the slope be falling? Wouldn't it be lying falling down? That's the negative portion on this side. When it's zero, it's actually on the origin. Its value is indeed zero. That's where the shape of it comes from, okay? So you know. We're going to get into these kinds of functions this year. Let's do one last example. Work on this tonight. Let's finish the example. The homework tonight is on the next slide. Okay, you can go ahead and look at the next slide right now. This is already recorded in my video. If you have questions or you want to see the answer, you can also look at my notes that are typed tonight. Homework, okay? And these are all of the uh, links. I need to update my notes. Your links might not be on there right now. I apologize if they're not. I think I saw it the other day. But look at my notes on Moodle. I'm going to put up my notes tonight with all the answers to everything we did today. It'll be right under Section 1-1 Slides. It'll appear right after that. Okay? So make sure you work on this homework tonight, 1 through 39 odd. Submit it to Dropbox tonight when you're done. You could do your notes on the next slide. Just press add a new page on your notes right now and do your homework right there. You don't need to make a new notability file. So continue with your notes on the next page, please, and do your homework right there. And upload your notes and your homework as one document to Dropbox tonight. If you have issues, don't freak out tonight. Just email me your homework if you have issues, okay?